Well, what's up, everybody? I hope everybody's doing well. I just want to introduce myself. myself my name is John, and uh, if you don't know me, I'm the campus pastor over at our Mosley campus. It's my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure. I just want to thank Pastor Stan uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. If y'all don't, yesterday marked the fifth year anniversary for me working here at the church, and thank you. Appreciate it. But that's because of, of that man, Pastor Stan. And if you're watching, thank you, brother. I just, I'm so grateful for the opportunity you have given me. Um, I'm forever grateful. Thank you. Uh, so tonight, as with most of the first Wednesdays, we're going to be talking about worship. And uh, I don't have slides. I don't have anything on the screen. So you got to take notes. And I do encourage you, take notes, because I think God has a word for us tonight. And uh, the title of today's message is The Seriousness of Worship. The Seriousness of Worship worship. About nine years ago, uh, I got my first motorcycle, and uh, I loved it, man. I've always wanted to ride a bike. I, I was super excited, and uh, one day, I was riding the bike. My brother was following me because I had to drop the bike off uh, to get some work done, and I was riding where this guy lived. He lived on some back roads. I really have never ridden on these roads or even driven on these roads, and so I, I was just going, and I was getting cocky. I was getting excited, and I got in a wreck. And uh, thank God I walked away. I only had a little bit of, uh, well, a lot of road rash. Uh, but listen, uh, I called my brother because I'm like, hey, bro, uh, I, I got in an accident. And he laughed at me and said, you're stupid. And so I was like, no, bro, I'm serious. I said, I said man, I'm, I'm serious. I just got in an accident. The bike is totaled. I'm good, but I need you to come right now. And, and whenever somebody says something like, nah, man, nah, bro, I'm serious, that follows a different type of temperament. You know, that follows, that comes with a different type of attention when somebody says, nah, really, I'm serious about what I'm telling you. And in a few minutes, we're going to go um, and have the opportunity to worship God, but I, I want you all to have a different perspective on worship tonight, um, a perspective that I, I needed the reminder of, and, and that is that God takes who we worship and how we worship very seriously. He doesn't take it lightly. And so we're going to be in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 7. Um, we're going to be starting at verse 19. So just a little background before we get into the text. Solomon uh, it has now fulfilled the promise that God gave his dad, David, that one of his sons, David, would build the temple. And Solomon was that son. And so Solomon built the temple, and, and, and the chapter before chapter 7, and all, the whole chapter, chapter 6, was filled with praying, praising, and worshiping God. So when you read it, you can tell Solomon is not, he knows how to worship God. He's not new to worshiping God. And so God responded to his worship and prayer with fire and burned up all of his offerings. And I know that may sound dramatic, but this is a good sign. You know, often God's fire represented his presence in the Bible. So God showed that he accepted what Solomon had done in building the temple. He received it. And, and for the next seven days after he built the temple, they just worshiped God. It was a straight revival. It was amazing. But let's see what God's response to all of that was. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 19. He says, the word says, but if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the decrees and commands I have given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then I will uproot the people from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honor my name. I will make it an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled. They will ask, ask why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? Verse 22, and the answer will be because his people abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt, and they worshiped other gods and bowed down to them. That is why he has brought all these disasters on them. Can't get any clearer than that. God's like, yo, Solomon, my boy, like I, I've, I've received the worship. I've shown that. I've sent down fire. I've absorbed your offerings. But don't get it confused that worship isn't a one-time thing. That worship must continue, and, and, and just be clear, you should have no other gods except for me. Now, I'm obviously paraphrasing, but that's what I hear. No other gods. Nothing else should be before me, and it sounds pretty serious. 
It has serious implications where we place our worship. So some of you, I'm not going to assume you know who Solomon is. Who is Solomon? Solomon, like I said before, is the son of King David. He was chosen after his father David died to be the next king of Israel and to build the temple in Jerusalem. Solomon received two in-person meetings with God. He was blessed with the distinction of being the wisest man to ever live and will ever live. Also, he was one of the wealthiest men ever in life, despite having every spiritual and every physical need Solomon was ultimately moved by something else other than affection for God. It was women. About a thousand women to be exact. Our boy Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, having several wives, did somebody just woo? <laughs> Come on, man. That's, <laughs> for, for, that's terrible. For the Bible, that, you know, having several wives is not, you know, foreign. This, this was often something that happened, though this is, ex ex is excessive. But God specifically told the people of Israel to not intermarry with other nations because of this. Why? They will surely turn their hearts after other gods. So this is an important piece in the story about our boy Solomon, because I've, I've heard many speakers speak about this, and they, and they use this passage on, on why not to have a lot of women. But I think it's a lot more deeper than that. I think this scripture tells us and shows us, hey, no one else should have your affection. That there's things out here, that, that there's people maybe even out here that will draw your heart away from the living God. And Solomon obviously didn't take that very seriously. First Kings chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 reads, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel. We just read about this. You must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Verse 5, Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. Further down in the scripture, it says the Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. Verse 11, so now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my commandment and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. What we see here is a man who didn't take worship to God serious enough. Two things I want to point out that Solomon missed and that hopefully in our worship to God, we will get right. It'll give us an awareness of how serious our worship to God really is. So if you're taking notes, my first point is this. God's instructions are serious. God's instructions are serious. Verse 10, God said he had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's commands. He did not listen to what God instructed him to do. Why is listening to God's instructions so important? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit leads us to all truth. And I don't know about you, man, but in a world where everybody has an opinion and everybody has something to say, I'm desperate for the truth. And the Bible says that he leads us to all of it. And why does, that, why does that matter? Because only the Spirit of God will and can lead us to what is true. As wise as Solomon was, he missed that. He was not being led by the Spirit. He was being led by his flesh. As strong as his wisdom was, his flesh was stronger, like us sometimes. We allow things we desire to lead us more than we allow God to lead us. This is, it's so important to be led by the Spirit because the Spirit of God locks in with our spirit that is actually willing to obey and worship God. Our flesh is not. Our flesh is weak. Our flesh is selfish and self-serving. The spirit locks in with our spirit. And I wanna say it again, the spirit leads us to what is true. What is true of the world we live in, but more importantly, what is true about us. God already was aware of Solomon's temptations. He knew the lineage he came from. If you go back and read it, David, his dad, had struggles with women as well. So God already knew about Solomon. He created Solomon. 
What I love about the Spirit of God, it draws us to truth about ourselves. About seven or eight years ago, uh, TikTok released, I believe. And I remember being over my, my parents' house, and my sister was on TikTok. I didn't know what this was. She was on TikTok. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, this is awesome. I, I downloaded it immediately. And as I began to scroll, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me, delete it right now. This app, this entertainment will lead you to sin. To this day, I don't have Instagram. I don't have TikTok. I really don't have anything. Some of y'all be like, oh, I'll follow you on Facebook. Listen, man, I'm boring as I don't know what on Facebook. So if you follow me, I'm, I apologize. But I have about 10 minutes a day just to find out which one of y'all had a birthday, and then it locks up. Now, here's the thing. This is not an indictment on social media. This is not an indictment or me being negative about Instagram or TikTok. God was instructing me directly and clearly, John, you don't need that. That's going to lead you to sin. And so I had to be obedient. I had to lean in to what the Spirit was telling me. No regrets. I ain't missing out on nothing. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has led me to a truth about myself. I know about John. And so I want to ask you, I want to encourage you as we worship and ask God to fill us with his spirit tonight and let his spirit reign and move. We sung it all before, man. We are saying, let your truth, O oh God, instruct me in what to do. Instruct me on where to go. Instruct me what to say. Because it's serious. It has serious implications and listening to the instructions of God. Now, some of y'all think, oh, yeah, John, because you're married. And da, da, da. I wasn't married when he told me this. I didn't have a child on the way when he told me this. God said, follow my instructions because it's best for you. It's, it's, it's what's good for you. It's not, it's not tied up in a 30-minute worship set. No, the worship and the instruction that I give you is going to carry you in every aspect of your life because it's serious. He takes it seriously. I'm reminded of this, this song. I, I love worship songs, and, and it often gives me words to say to God when I don't have words to say. And, and it's a song called Oceans. Most of you have heard it before. It's by Hillsong. I just want to read these instructions, what, what, what they're telling us that God can do for us. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters, wherever you will call me. Take me deeper, God, that my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. God, instruct me on how to trust you. Instruct me on what direction to take. Instruct me so that I won't wander like Solomon did. Instruct me how to be stronger in my faith. This is what we should desire. And it's interesting enough that Solomon says in Proverbs 1-7, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, how could he say that? Because he lived it. I, I truly believe Solomon is speaking through a testimony. It's foolish not to listen to God. I'm telling you, I had all these women. They led me to worship these gods. It's foolish if you're not listening to Yahweh. You must. I love what Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 says. Dear friend, this is Paul talking to the church of Philippi. Dear friends, you always follow my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. How does God work through, how does God work through us to be obedient? He instructs us by his spirit. That's how he works through us. Y'all say, John, show me where he says that. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart, and will put in you a new spirit. I will take your stony and stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you, so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. The beauty of all of this is that you don't have to do it on your own. Is that worship to God is saying, allow my spirit to lead you 
and give you direction and give you instruction. Solomon missed it a little bit, but we have, a, we have an opportunity by the grace of God to be obedient to what God tells us to do because it's so important. Tonight, I encourage you, be sensitive to the instructions God has given you. Personally, I, I think it happens first by hearing God's word. You're hearing it right now. He's telling us what he wants us to do. I'm not telling you to listen for a voice. I'm saying listen to God's word. He's instructing us. He's already told us what to do. It's serious. Another thing, this is my second point I think Solomon missed, was God's presence is serious. The Lord said he was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. I feel like it's interesting. Noticing God does not refer back to the temple. He doesn't, he doesn't refer back to the temple where he absorbed all of the burnt offerings. He goes back, I was with you twice. If you've never read it, there was one time that God was with Solomon in, in, in Gibeon. And Solomon was about to be king. And he was desperate for God to give him direction. He said, God, I don't know how to lead these people. God said, whatever you want, I'll give you. He said, God, I don't know how to lead them. I need instruction. So God spent an intimate time. The second time God was with him, he had met him right after he built the temple. So he met Solomon when he was desperate, and he met Solomon when he was very tired, in the most intimate times of his life. And so, yes, I think God is mad because his law says, listen, thou shalt not have no other God before me. He stands by his word. But I also think he was a little angry at Solomon because he was the only one there in his intimate times. He was the only one there. Those other gods weren't there when he needed them. Those other gods he wasn't crying to for guidance to be king. Those other gods weren't there when he needed help when he built the temple. God was. And so God's been there for us, man. And, 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 and now when we, when we think about where Solomon is and God's like, I'm angry. He's like, Solomon, you had me in the temple, but what about your home? God, you worshiped me. God's like, Solomon, you worshiped me in church. But what about your bedroom? What about the places you frequent? And the Bible says he was angry at Solomon because it's serious. He takes worship very, very serious. And his presence, it says that God was so angry with Solomon. Solomon gave himself over to other gods that weren't with him during the hard times. They weren't with him in the fire. Those moments seem to not have been serious enough for Solomon to continue to worship God solely. He seemed to have forgot for whatever reason about his intimate moments with God. I want to implore you tonight, don't forget when God has come through for you. A lot of times it, a lot of times it spearheads our worship. A lot of times it gears us up for who God is. Because that's all worship is. It's not about us. It's about him. True worship is when you're aware of God's presence in everything you do. Because God's presence is serious. Worship to God is taking what he says to us very serious, man. I believe it through his word. And it's a healthy reverence for the presence of God that though we acknowledge it or not, he is always there. I can only imagine, man, if I'm just using conjecture of the times that Solomon was with these women. And God was still there. And it broke his heart. Because he gave his worship, he gave his energy, he gave his... He gave us everything to false gods. Going back to Proverbs again, Solomon knew what to do. He just failed to act on it at the end. He said in Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Where did Solomon miss it? What, what mistakes did he make? I think he makes the same mistakes that we do. It's not that we don't love God. It's not that we have defected from the faith. It's not that we, have no long, we no longer want to be Jesus followers or Christians. It's we don't fear God. Because if we fear God, everything that we do will be of worship to him. If we feared God, everything we say, everything we do, everywhere we go, we're acknowledging his presence and we're acknowledging that he is God Almighty, that his instructions are clear. We're acknowledging what the word says. We're acknowledging what he says in his word, that it's true and that it's real. 
And it's not that we don't love them, we just don't fear them. I ask myself the same thing every time I sin, every time I walk in pride instead of humility. Every time I make worshiping God more about myself than about him. I don't fear him. Say he's gracious. His mercies are new. We love those scriptures, and I do too. They're amazing. But I really stand back when God says he's angry, when he's mad at his, at his son, the wisest to ever live. If you think you're smart, we're not smart enough. I want us to reverence God with fear and trembling. And I think the only way we can do that, man, is I think I go back to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15. Verses 8, he says, the people honor me with their lips, with their hearts. Who they really are are far from me. In vain do they worship me. And who are these people <laughs> that Jesus is referring to? Religious people. And before you, you know, judge and say, oh, those religious people, th- those people that go to church, those people that pay their tithes, th- those people that serve, those people that are in small groups. That's who he's talking to. With their lips, they praise me. Solomon knew he wrote 31 Proverbs. He knew what to say. But let us not be those who know what to do and not do it. That's sin. Let us be not those who know about a good God that knows he deserves and, 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 and looks to be worshiped with all of us, and we only give him our mind. We only give him blanket statements that we've learned in church. God wants all of us. So he said, you love me, obey me. He said, oh, John, man, what's the the answer for us then? Where's the hope at? I believe ultimately we're able to take worship to God seriously when we take what Jesus did on the cross seriously. When we sit back and we look at the cross, that stirs an emotion in us. It should stir an emotion in us that brings worship, that brings honor, that brings glory to a living God. He laid his life down for us, removing scales from our eyes, tearing down the veil that was between us and God. That gap, that chasm, He did that. So if we look to God, the creator of all, loving and kind, yes, but is our our life angering him? Is he upset? Is he mad? We got to all ask ourselves that. The price Jesus paid for you and me was serious. It was weighty. It was heavy. It was not small. It was big. I said, John, I heard that before. I know it was good. Oh, we love Jesus. Man, I have a burden for myself. I have a burden for the church that we just don't take worship to God serious enough. And if we look at the story of Solomon, if we look at our own story of the things that we're prone to worship, John, prone to worship people, prone to worship culture, prone to worship things. We gotta lay that down. It angers him. Why does it anger him? Because I'm his. He bought me with a hefty price. It wasn't cheap. So my worship to him shouldn't be cheap. The price wasn't small, so my worship to God should not be small. The price wasn't light, so man, we should not have a light worship to our God. We should have a heavy, weighty, passionate worship for the God that we say we serve. Acknowledging the seriousness of his presence. Acknowledging the seriousness of his instruction and his guidance. Because he is God. He created all things. And we just got to bring that back to us, man. We got to bring that back to the church. 
It can't just be in church. It can't just be in these four walls. He wants your home. He wants your family. He wants your hobbies. He wants your vacation. He wants it all. That's the seriousness of worship. It's not a song to be sung. It's not every first Wednesday. It's your life, man. We stand before a holy God. What will he see? Will he see religion? Will he see, well, will he see a son or daughter that took the weight of the cross so seriously that they gave him all of their life, that in everywhere they went, his presence was there, that in whatever he told them to do, no matter how strong, no, how, no matter how outlandish, no, no matter how much it hurt, God, whatever you say, do, I'm going to do it. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for for me. And I'm in it with you, man. Tonight I'm trying to give it to God again. Not just 99% of me, but 100 in every way, in every shape, and in every form. If everybody could stand. I just want to pray with us, man. Like, 